Jim, would you uh, tell us your uh, birth date, where you're born, your uh, names of your mother and father, brothers and sisters, and your grandparents? Well, my, my name is James A. Cooper. I was born May 4th, 1932. I have a sister named Halima. Should I use her name, the Cooper? Whole thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Her regular her, her Halima Cooper too, like me. Yeah, and if her, she's got a married name. Oh, well, Halima Jordan right now. Halima Cooper Jordan. Yeah. Okay. Beulah Cooper, but I don't know her last name. It's okay. And uh, Susan. I don't know her last name either. She, her and Halima are living yet. They live in Oneida. Okay. Then I had a half sister named Mary, Mary Smith, who was married to Jasper John. Okay. Yeah. That's it, as far okay. as my my relations concerned. Now, your mother and father. My father was Thaddeus Christian. My mother was Louise Cooper. And that's about all I can tell you about them. Okay. What about your grandparents? Do you remember anything? About I, them? I don't know nothing about my relation. It's really a shame, but that's it. My grandparents, that I call my grandparents, uh, was uh, really not, but he was like my grandfather. It was Lafayette Webster. Lafayette and uh, I can't think of my grandma's name. I call them grandma and grandpa, you know, until I got adopted out. Yeah. Lafayette. I didn't remember that name. But yeah. I you know Itzy? Itzy. Ellsworth Webster? Oh, Itzy, yeah. That yeah. really was his grandma and grandpa. Okay. And okay. we were raised together till I went to a foster home in Appleton. Itzy is the one with the... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. He lives down behind the John Danford now. Yeah, somewhere around there. Yeah, I guess he got a place, yeah. Okay. He used to live up in Redstone for a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, all of us grew up together... Uh, South of Chicago Corners, under the, uh, there. That's where we lived a little ways down there. We, where Everett Cornelius and all of us grew up. Oh, by Goosetown? Yeah, past Goosetown. We were about a half a mile past Goosetown. We were. Oh. But we all grew up in that area. Okay. My friends, like Everett is a, he's a singer. Yeah. Yeah. Like I got a singing group here, too. Yeah. Oh, you're the Cooper. Mm hmm. Okay, okay, I heard of you. Yeah. Uh, we got, uh, believe it or not, we've been singing for. Well, first, let me tell you how this started. Father Ed, do you know Father Ed? Oh, yeah. He came up to me one day and he says, Cooper, he says, I've been to several Oneida funerals and no singing. He says, why don't you get a group to sing? I says, man, how can I get a group? I says, I sing, but I sing with, with like, somebody who asked me to sing with them, you know. And he said, no, you need a group. So that's how I got this group. We started off, we had... <laughs> 15 people in my house. I, they, they meet at my house. Tonight, in fact, is our meeting. We meet once a week. So I, I finally boiled down and I got these, this group. I got six women and myself and another fellow. And we do a beautiful job wherever we go. When Ida has given us credit finally that they recognize our, our singing. They didn't at first, you know. It's, uh, I don't know, kind of funny people sometimes. And, they, uh, and then they heard us. And then we sang with them here several times for funerals and stuff. Now Oneida kind of recognizes my group. It's only six of them, six women and two guys, but we've been all over. We sang for a big, oh gee, a big group here. Uh, they're rich people here. You call them the Jewish people. They got a big outfit here. We sang, we sang all over. Yeah, my little who's group. The, who's the, uh, you, can you give me the names of your group? Yeah, two of them are my nieces, uh, Kim Reyes. Do you happen to know her? She's always up to a night with her nose and something. Kim Reyes, Mimi Aurelio, I don't know how to spell that. Uh, Opal Scandar. Opal, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. Opal Scandar. Uh, Marlene Silas, okay, 
that's uh, Babe's wife. Uh, see, let me tell you something. I had a stroke, and it's hard for me to remember, you know, because, uh, and uh, that's four women. See, I need two more. They're all coming over and they're doing, I can't think of them. Well, I'll put the man in there for okay. now. Uh, Orrin John. And myself, which is James Cooper. Oh, Clara. Gee, I can't think of her last name. She's got a funny name, but she's another one. And uh, there's one more, but I can't think of her name right now. I got six of them anyway. Sure. Yeah. Is there a Shirley? She's a Cornelius, but she's... Oh, no. See, she, they have their... Let me tell you about them. They have their own group, mostly a relation. But they won't sing at funerals or nothing. I don't know what's the story with them, uh, you know. And uh, that's how I, this group came about. Yeah. I know her real good. She, yeah, they got a singing group, Shirley. Shirley, uh, I don't know what's... It ain't Cornelius. Lafour. Lafour. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Shirley and Leonard. Then mm -hmm. they all sing together. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, they called us up and wanted us to get together with them. And I said we would, you know. But uh, she's all right, you know. But they don't sing at wakes and stuff like we would, you know. And which is good we did, because we sing at a lot of wakes. Or, well, we haven't, which is good. <laughs> yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. But we will sing. I mean, if they. Good. And you know what? I had a call up, because, see, I can't do nothing that is going to be against Oneida, Oneida's singing group. So when we started this group, I didn't know what to do. So some Chippewas called me up and asked me if we'd sing it a week. And one was awaiting, and another one was awake. Well, I didn't know what to do, so I called up Melinda Doxter, you know, mm. and I asked her, I says, What's the story here? Because I can remember when I was growing up that Oneida never did this. They just sang it around Oneida and, you know, they had three, four groups in Oneida when I was growing up. <clears throat> and she told me that if you feel like you should sing, she says, we've branched out too. We sing all over too now. They sing for Lost Loon groups and all over. And so I said, well, then it would be all right then if we sang at a Chippewa Wake. She says, yes. If they like you and they want to, we went there. We sang at this first trip while awake. It was unbelievable. Everything was just quiet, you know. But what I do when people that don't understand when I just sing and I get up and I tell them, these are all religious songs that we're singing. But there are about four or five funeral songs in here that are strictly sang at funerals. And I happen to know them, you know. Uh, and I would tell them, these are the songs that we are going to sing last. So then they'd understand it, you know. Gee, we, we got some pretty good responses, uh, you know. So, with my little group. <laughs> yeah. Other than that, that's, I can't. Eleanor, that's that old lady's name, Eleanor. Eleanor, I, I know you know her too. She's a real big woman. She goes all over. I can't think of her last name. Well, she's divorced, that's probably why I can't think of it. But that's my last singer. I should have six women now, right? Yeah. Yeah, and the orange on them, yeah. So that's about it with my singing group. Okay. Well, let's go back to when you were younger. And uh, why don't you try to give me uh, what you can remember, you know, about when you were growing up. Well... When I was born, believe it or not, they were fighting over me. I, I uh, you know, I was home to home and so forth. And, and there was, at that time, the Oneidas, some of the Oneidas were Catholic, some of them were Protestant, Lutheran, and so forth. And everybody wanted me, my relation partner. Well, I ended up with a, a man and a woman by the name of uh, Sarah and Ulysses Webster. Just north, uh, going on, on Freedom Road, there. Okay, how f about how far now? Give me an... Is that a, there's a tavern right on a hill there. Like Garrisons? Yeah, no, further down. Oh, Tips? South, yeah. 
Just oh, by about the quarry. A half, yeah, by the just quarry. about a half a mile south there on, okay. uh, on the, what is that, double E, is that E or what? E and double E yeah. there. About a half a mile down the road, these people took me. I stayed with them till I was, oh, I was in grade school. I, I went to uh, the Catholic school at, by Vandenberg's. Vans, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I stayed there till, I think I was in the first or second grade. Well, then he died, and she was too old, so they wouldn't let me stay with her no more. So I went with, actually it was my uncle, Guy and Naomi John. Now they raised me then, from then on till. Well, where, was it, where did they reside? Um, they were on uh, just south of Moss's store on that road. Okay. Uh, about a mile. On each. Yeah, yeah. That's where they lived. And uh, I stayed with them till I think the war ended then. And when Guy came home, he just wanted his own kids. You know, he had four kids too, you know. And plus, well, in the meantime, my sisters had vanished, or they didn't vanish, they took off, and they got married kind of young, you know. So there was just me then, and well, I got very fortunate, and I got adopted. I, I didn't get adopted out. They took me. Uh, some white people took me in Appleton. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. C. C. Meyer. He was the uh, second largest beekeeper in Wisconsin. So beekeeper? I, yeah. So yeah. I grew. I grew up with bees, <laughs> and uh, they were really kind of proud of me, you know, because. They had a son too that's a little older than me, and they had another one that was older too. But I'd go out in that bee yard, man. I'd be all decked out though, <laughs> so I wouldn't get stung. But you're going to get stung. But I stayed with them. I think I was in a sixth grade, all the way through high school, and Korea broke out, and I went in service. You know. How old were you when you went into service? Eighteen, I think. Eighteen. Okay. Eighteen, I think I went in the service, and I went to. Uh, well, I've been. I spent a lot of time in the service. I went to Korea, and then I got involved in the uh, A bomb and H bomb projects. I could never get out of that. Once you get that top secret clearance, you know you're always in it. And I'd be overseas. I'd be out here in Nevada or the Yucca Flats. What would they have you do? Well, uh, that time I was a cook. We were just. Uh, but you were part of the unit. Then. Yeah, we were. We belonged to the unit. We didn't set the A-bombs off. No, there was. We we were just support group. Mm -hmm. Whatever squadron I was in, I was in the Air Force. That's all my time was spent in the Air Force. And I, I, I was uh, involved in a lot of that. And then I, I got out of the service. How many years did you serve? Oh, I had about fourteen. Uh, I got out of the service. And I came here to Milwaukee. I left them people in Appleton like a fool. They never did see me for quite a few years. And I came here to Milwaukee to, I don't know, be amongst Indians, I guess. And uh, I couldn't get adjusted. So I went back in. Went back in the service. This time I ended up in Vietnam. <laughs> You'll see, it must have, you must have did a tour there. Yeah, or? yeah, I did a tour there in Vietnam and then in the Air Force again? Yeah, and then we went to Thailand, and then, well, in the meantime, in my services, and I was a year in the National Guard when I was in Apple, and all that kind of, I had almost 14 years in, and I come back, and I guess that's it. I'm getting out this time. I got out, which I shouldn't have. I should have did like my friends did. They went to Japan and filled a tour, and then they came back, and they're almost ready for retirement. So all that years were just experience. Were you pretty much uh, working in the same kind of unit? Oh, no, I was, no, I was a cook. In the I was unit? in uh, refueling. That's where mostly I worked in refueling all the other years. Not not air to air on the ground. Yeah. So, and then I, uh, well, I got out and I came back to Milwaukee here. And then uh, I met my lady and got married and what was your wife's name? Edward, it's, uh, we're divorced now. Uh, Alfreda Young. You know, she was just here. Uh, but uh, this is a funny story. Okay. We got married. 
We lived together about three, four years and just couldn't, something couldn't click right. I didn't beat her or nothing or she didn't beat me. We just, something wasn't there. So we got divorced. Well, I went to drinking. You know, I mean, I, I didn't go with another one. I just was a complete drunk. I worked, but I... And somehow we went back together. I mean, we started seeing each other. We've been together ever since. We never got married. We own our own home, you know, but it just seemed to work out better. And I'm lucky because since I had the stroke and other things, I got bad heart. I just, everything's wrong with me. She stuck right by my side. She's a heck of a woman. But we just never did get remarried. But I imagine that was the woman for me, because <laughs> we're back together. That's the one that was just, just here, dropped me off. And, and uh, she's working now for, she helps the elderly out. You know, every day she's got a different person, three, four hours a day, because she's retired too. From the, She was a teacher at Allen Field School. She's a Potawatomi Indian. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess that. Well, after you come back from the uh, service, uh, what kind of work did you do? Uh, oh, I, I, uh, I did out around on different jobs and finally uh, I went to work in a machine shop and I retired in a machine shop. What'd you, what, what shop was that? Heinemat. Hi, hmm. Matt. They used to live, be right down here on 6th in Virginia. What'd you run? Everything. I was not a machinist. I mean, at the, but I could do everything a machinist did. Machine operator? Yeah. I run lathes. Boring uh, bar? Boring, everything. You know, I could Real run it. They taught me how to run it down here on 6th Street. Mm -hmm. Then they bought a big building out of their way in south of here. And that's where I retired at. And about, that was terrible. I'm, let's see, I'm 60. It's going to be going to be 65 and I told Alfredo when I'm 62 I'm going to retire because so we can do something. I retired in May of 62 and we like to play bingo you know we used to go to Oneida and all over you know all over to play. I retired in May of 62 and September uh, September that year it was time for her to go back to school so I got my little job at Food Mart 7-Eleven on a Thursday I worked, Friday I worked, Saturday I had a stroke. That's terrible, you know, I mean, I'm not angry about it now, no, but I, I was, you, you know, sure, but, uh, sure. and I had a stroke, <clears throat> and I was blind, completely blind. And she used to come and I used to tell her, you don't have to come to feed me, she'd come there every day, and oh, geez, that's the kind of woman she is, I'm telling you, you know. And then uh, I think I was in there three, four days, and geez, I opened my eyes up and I could see, like I can now, which ain't very good, but they're working on it now. So I stayed like, I'd like to be like that forever. But uh, then uh, I run out of insurance, because I could keep my insurance from work for a year and a half, which was still expensive. Then I run out, you know, and they, they wanted $2,000 every, every three months, and gee, who can pay that, you know? And, uh, Sure, I probably could have went to one. I had, uh, I've asked them for some help, but they get kind of funny up there. And so I just, and I went to the VA. Well, you know, when you go to VA, you, you can plan on sitting there for a while. Well, I sat there for about two months, seeing different people. And finally, I seen this one good doctor, and he was my doctor for a while. Then they, sh they give you what they call a prime care doctor. That's your doctor. And you don't have to go sit through all this crap. You just call up and say, I want to see Dr. So I have a woman. Well, I got her and I went to see, I went, that was, that's been my doctor ever since, you know. But I was having trouble with my eyes. They wouldn't do nothing. Look at me every six, seven months. But now they change, I see. So I went to uh, my own eye doctor that I had before. Man, the kind of money they wanted, I couldn't come up with that. So, so I'm at the VA now and they're, they're doing something now, finally. You know, they tested my eyes the other day and they try to get my eyesight back. It's never going to be completely back because I had a, when I had a stroke, it damaged my eyes also, you know. So it won't be like, say, you had an operation, but it'll, I'm supposed to be able to see better. See, I can't read, and I did a lot of reading in my days, man, you know. I, 
Well, all you can do is sing, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we sing tonight. <laughs> yeah, that's about all I can do. And, mm. and, uh, well, that's a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. These guys, I really fixed them the other day. We had, they didn't know a lot of songs. They didn't realize they knew that many. Well, we probably don't know as many as Oneida does, but they, they got some old timers up there, you know. <laughs> and these, these guys are young, 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 young people. Like uh, Orrin and I are about the oldest ones, and then it really drops during their thirties, maybe, and you know. And so uh, I I went through the book the other day. They couldn't believe how many songs they knew. You know, we started at the beginning, we went right through the end. And uh, did you record those? No, we we recorded. See, not them. We did, but we recorded, and the recording they wouldn't listen to me. They didn't, this, this, my friend that's singing with us goes to this church where we recorded that and the guy that recorded us listened to him. Well, they didn't bring the bass up. They're used to singing like in church, you know, where everybody's at an evil key. Now, if you know all this one night is singing, you hear the bass, you know. Well, they did that on this one. So now they're re-recording it. They're bringing the bass up. And we got three more songs we're going to sing to fill this recording out, and then we'll have we'll have a recording out. So that'll be nice. Mm -hmm. And we, but Opal, I think it was Opal, took this recording and took it to Oneida. wasn't a good one, like I said, but she took it to Oneida and had somebody up there to listen to it. Some one of the singers, whoever I don't know, who, and they thought we did a good job, except for part of the bass, which wasn't our fault. So that went over pretty good. So now when we get this straightened out, and I don't know when, we'll have, we'll have some for sale. <laughs> Did you have any, uh, any children? No. No? Uh, okay. Just a stepson with her. She had one before she married me. I see. Okay. She had two, but one terribly mm -hmm. happened to her. Do you, have, um, do you have any other hobbies besides the United Singers? Well... <laughs> No, not right now. I can't get around, but I played a lot of softball. Did you? I played a lot of softball. In fact, I was going to play softball here in the elderly league, and then this happened. Mm -hmm. But I played a lot of softball in my life all the way through. You know, i tell you a funny story here, uh, but I did a lot of it in the service, too. I pitched fast pitch. Oh, fast pitch. Yeah. Okay. And everywhere I went, I would make the base team. I was that good, you know, not bragging or anything. But what happened? The Indians here in Milwaukee got a game with the Mexicans. And my friend, Pancho Prado, who was one of the better pitchers around, even in the service, was pitching for them, for the Mexicans, you know. They didn't know who was pitching for the Indians. And they, they come around there, and the Indians here always turned out for stuff. You know, if it was baseball, the Sunday, everybody was like in Oneida, you know. They kept asking, well, who's pitching for us? And somebody said, I was a little heavier than I am now, too. They said, Cooper. Cooper, they said, yeah, they, they laughed, and, you know, until I put my two feet on the mound, and then they found a little different story, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I beat Pancho, you know, set him down. And another thing, a good thing happened one time, I was stationed in Rapid City, South Dakota, and boy, that's prejudice as you can get, you know. So I was, you could pitch for the squadron or the base team. Well, I wouldn't play for the base team because I didn't like how they were. And we were playing this one white team for the championship. And this white pitcher they had, you could hear it all over. It was going all over the base. I'm going to beat that so-and-so Indian. And he didn't use them kind of words, you know. And I thought, oh, well, if you do, you do. He was good. He was good. We played him. We set him down. I set him down. And he didn't get a hit. Oh, I was so happy. And the people in the crowd were just cheering. But I was happy because of him. You know, I mean, the way he, you know, he wouldn't even shake my hand. He walked away. <laughs> Terrible people, some guys, some people, ain't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's the way. That's what uh, I guess that's the story of my life. Oh, I did. After I came to Milwaukee here, and Alfred and I got together, she said, "You go back to Appleton. You go back to Appleton. You see them people. You know, they raised me. You might as well say they raised me from sixth grade on. I think it was. So when I went to service, and I got out, and I went home there, but then I left there and came up." I went to see him. 
It's good I did. I guess a couple of years I was going up there to see him. And pretty soon Ma Meyer died and Pa Meyer died, so at least I did some good in my life. I mean, uh, you know, they were so happy to see me, you know, and uh, my friends there, some of them had me dead because <laughs> I never went back, you know, I uh, got up here. Well, like I told you, I got up here and I got to, I forgot about other life. I got to partying and goofiness and that was, it can take hold of you pretty quick if you let it, you know, so that's what happened. But, but now I'm, well, I'm not in good shape, but I'm, as far as my mind is, and I can remember. See, I have a hard time remembering with that stroke, you know. So, yeah. That's why everything that I do, I got to write down if Alfredo ain't home. I got to write it down, like if somebody calls up or something, you know. Like, uh, I think we missed a funeral one day on account of me. Somebody called us up, and I didn't write it down, and the next thing we know, these people, or Indians, yeah. were buried. And then <laughs> she was kind of mad, wondering why we didn't get invited. I said, we did. <laughs> I didn't tell her. I, well, that's can't help. But now I got a pencil and paper there. If something happened, I write it down. Like today, I call back up here. I forgot what she told me. I, I swore she told me today, but uh, you right on. You right on time today. Yeah, but they, I got it right. <laughs> so that's about it with me. I don't know what else I could tell you. Well, Except why don't you? Uh, You've been all over the world, and you know you've got a lot of experience. What kind of uh, what kind of advice would you give to some of these younger people that are coming up uh, that might help them from your things that you've seen and experienced? Well, what can you share with them? First of all, I would tell these young people, which I tell them around here. I'll get to a little story first. See, I was involved with a lot to do with the Oneidas up here, all the Indians. I was on, a, on several committees, you know, and uh, I'd been working with Indians here for quite a few years until this happened to me. And still, they, I still get phone calls asking me this, asking me what can they do with this, and then I have to tell them, would you call up so-and-so, maybe they can help you more than I can because, you know. But then again, on the other hand, sometimes I tell them, now, this is what, you know, I'm no scholar or anything, but in my mind is all through learning. I learned all this through my, myself, you know, after I got out of the service and became an Indian again, put it that way. Not that I didn't have bad people. I had good people that raised me, you know, but I became an Indian again. <clears throat> and uh, I would tell them, if you're young, the main thing is, First of all, treat your parents right. They're the ones who brought you in this world. And after that, please stay in school. That is very important nowadays. It ain't like when, say, I grew up or even maybe when you were growing up. You could get away with eighth, ninth grade and maybe go get a job at a factory downtown or something. You don't do that nowadays. Now they want, they want the diploma before they even talk to you. So I was telling a young kid, which I, I do once in a while around here, they'll ask me, I'll tell you, you gotta stay in school. You gotta stay in school. Because there's, and there's no one out there gonna help you like you think they are. No one's gonna help you. They'll look down on you nowadays. And being an Indian is worse, you know. I mean, they're still like that yet. Anywhere you go, you know, that's what I would tell them there. Please stay in school. Learn something. Trade or something. Even if it's to go in a factory, at least you learn this trade. You can do something. If you don't, you're going to be awful miserable and hurting. Then you're going to work in McDonald's. Now that's about right. You know? Yeah? Okay, what else Jim? was that you asked me? I think that was it. Oh. Unless you got another story for us. No, I... I think that's about it. That's, I, all, that's all the stories you're going to tell uh, us today? I told enough lies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it was been nice talking to you. And well, we want to thank you. We appreciate you sharing. 